but anyway yeah uh, well you wanted to um start off with uh, a, f- a few points didn't you lena yes yes i did uh honestly to fully understand the nature of imperial relations you kind of have to start at the beginning so you kind of have to start with the beginnings of colonial rule and the two subjects are distinct but they're sort of very interlinked um uh as in imperialism is the highest stage of capitalism it originates when uh capitalist states need to export finance capital to the periphery and so you can't get that without the net influx of resources Mm -hmm. that you get from colonial exploitation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have these five colonial powers, Portugal, Spain, England, France, and the Netherlands, and they sort of divide up much of the Americas and India between them. Uh, And through this, you get this evolution of Dutch and English capitalism. And from this begins uh, the start of imperial relations. Uh, You get the mercantile system, which re- requires the import of bullion, raw goods, and the export of manufactured goods. This is sort of the low stage, and this results in this primitive accumulation of capital in the core. But once you get this industrialization, then suddenly you have uh, specifically Britain, because for most of the 19th century, it was Britain. Britain was the dominant imperial power. Uh, Mm -hmm. you get the British uh, sort of enforcing and forcibly opening markets to export uh, manufactured goods in other countries. Uh, Specifically, I think the example that's most key is the opium wars. Mm. Um, China was, and sort of is like naturally, one of the largest exporters of goods on the planet. But Britain had a net deficit of bullion export, had a net deficit in trade with them. So they ended up losing a lot of bullion out of their treasury in exchange for Chinese goods. When you, when you say bullion, so, is it like literally bullion? Gold, literally gold and silver. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. Got it. Um, And so you get this conflict, which results in... uh what the Chinese called the century of humiliation, the forcible opening of what was at the time the last market in the world to uh, British finance capital. You get Hong Kong being built in Mm. order to manage trade in this manner. Mm. Uh, Yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm just reading over my notes. No, no, that's no okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is all all really, really important shit, as you say, Mm -hmm. like the, the, the history is absolutely key to it speaking of notes chat chat i hope you're all taking copious notes right chat i hope because there may or may not be a quiz at any point you chat, never know you the never know quiz, this is um a form of violence it's knowledge-based violence the threat of the quiz makes you uh, the threat of the quiz is um authoritarian <laughs> so that's say. right that's yeah. right. You have to you have to adhere to to the learning, otherwise. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's a struggle station. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> British British activity in India and China was the first kind of sort of economic infiltration and empire building of this kind. It was unprecedented in global history. Uh, hold on. Yeah, they did. They did a, a whole bunch of horrific shit to the. Uh, to like the king of India, right? I heard um, that they like pretended to be friends with like the top general, like what, a British general pretended to be like friends with one of the Indian top generals uh, and kept like just giving him little hints of like, hey, you ever think about being king and shit like that and just being like, oh, it wouldn't be crazy if you just were king. Like imagine, like you got a load of guns as well. Like you could just yeah, do yeah. it, you know? And uh, and then apparently, like he did kill the king of India, and then he was like, "Yeah, you're gonna make me king now." And they and the British just murdered him. Like for, for oh, most shit. of the period, mm. for most of the period constituting uh, industrialization, and for most of the period beforehand, uh, most of the economic activity was focused on building up massive reserves of gold and silver. 
Uh, right. This was the foundation of the Spanish Empire for a very long time, was taking resources from the Earth. And mm. even when it wasn't that, it was still the ex resource exploitation, just of a different sort. You see this also in the North American British colonies, mm. uh, where it's focused on the plentiful and fertile soil, which you can use to grow rice, uh, in indigo, that sort of thing. They didn't really care about the peoples of the area. They wanted, yeah. it wasn't even a labor relation. It was in order to simply take these raw resources. Mm -hmm. But as the resources got depleted, the assets left in those places was the labor of the people there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Hmm. So once the assets are depleted and you still have this like captive, exploited, dependent workforce, is that what we're saying? Then, then what happens after yeah, that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Then what, uh, yeah. So the, how do we? How what happens after that in the story? So you start. So Lenin describes uh, imperialism as sort of a merging of manufacturing and finance capital. Um. <sighs> I time. have my notes here. Yeah. Uh, chat should be taking notes. So that's, so all these, so if you need to take a pause, then chat can catch up because chat <laughs> is taking notes. That's right. Ch chat. And I'm also taking notes. Definitely, definitely was taking notes the whole time. I definitely didn't forget to take notes last <laughs> time. So, so in contrast to this previous sort of competitive capitalism between imperial states. You get this sort of monopoly capitalism. Uh, you get people moving from the core to the periphery, not out of any sort of, you know, basic human migration, but to establish enterprises there mm -hmm. that can be used to exploit the labor of those places. Mm -hmm. That sort of economic relation is relationship is flipped on its head. Okay. Uh, and this and this sort of began to take hold in the latter half of the 19th century. Okay. Uh, and you see this mainly in Britain first. Uh, we, we call this period the, the British century for a reason, uh, Pax Britannica. And that was because Britain was basically the, essentially the sole dominant power. But a new power began to rise uh, starting around the 1870s, and that was the German Empire. Uh, and with the rise of the German Empire, the last major region on Earth that hadn't totally succumbed to imperial domination, which was the continent of Africa, got divided at the Congress of Berlin. And this was sort of the end of it. This There was no more territory to conquer. <laughs> there was nothing else. Hmm. So now you have these two competing empires, Germany and Britain. And the British were really, really scared of increasing German influence. And so you get this sort of uh, competition uh, beginning in 1886 and continuing into the early 20th century. You have the Anglo-German Anglo naval arms race. You have the formation of great imperial power blocks in continental Europe. Uh, and sort of this is all coming to a head. There's so much writing at stake and then the first world war breaks out which is explicitly a war between imperial powers mm -hmm. yeah and this is where the relevance to today's conversation comes in because this is when lenin was sort of active in the socialist parties of europe and his position along with karl liebknecht or liebknecht uh was a uh, that socialists should strive to make their power stand down to not involve themselves in this mm -hmm. and this is called revolutionary defeatism hmm. so opposition to inter-imperialist war so this is like the no war but class war type perspective where it's like any war between these powers is going to serve capitalist capitalism or in this case you could just straight up just say in, i guess in imperialism or, or the or the or the ruling class you know um it will will yeah. never serve the proletariat is that a fair like i don't yes, i don't know a lot exactly. about Lenin, but yeah. i'm trying yeah, yeah. to learn inter inter-imperial war serves only mm -hmm. to hurt the working class of the world yeah mm -hmm. i saw um some people just recently you know like um trying to do dunks on i think it was like the the Brit the um communist party of britain where they had put out a thing saying you know like 
we our position is that you know the uk shouldn't get involved in this or whatever and mm-hmm. people were using it as a shot to take dunks i saw some person was like oh yeah and you know mm-hmm. back in the day the british communists uh, opposed getting involved in world war ii as well you know this was like their party line or whatever and it's like i th- feel like you know people using it as a like oh but they didn't they didn't want to fight the nazis but i think it's like no it's like a pretty consistent position of mm-hmm. you know like a lot of communist parties around the world that working class people they shouldn't send working class people to mm-hmm. go die in inter-imperialist conflicts yeah. and yeah. things like that like yeah. i don't think this is a surprising take and i think that like anyone that looks at this and finds this like surprising or like shock you know like mm-hmm. or whatever is probably doesn't know about what you know like they don't know what communist parties are or what they're trying to do really. yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. that's yeah. the thing as well isn't it it's like everybody in britain is always too quick to forget just like how fascist we have been all yeah. over the world in our, Ooh, yeah, in yeah, our yeah. empires you know so it's uh yeah it's, hey, we it's, don't it's forget absurd that. yeah no for sure i bet you don't yeah. <laughs> so so you get in 1902 this guy his name is uh john a hobson and uh, he was sort of one of the first to write on this mode, this shift in how capitalism functions. Um, there were anti-imperialists before him. There was the Anti-Imperialist Society in the United States, for example, that opposed U.S. Uh, war on Spain uh, and the annexation of the Philippines. But Hobson was one of the first to write on this. And his whole thing was that imperialism was sort of this combination of nationalist and capitalist fervor that results in exploitation overseas for the benefit of business by governments uh but he did not see this as inherent to capitalism he saw it as something that could be fixed lenin breaks with him on this also he was a massive anti-semite but regardless Mm -hmm. (laughs) lenin breaks with him on both of those and sees this as not the a result of a side result of capitalism that could be avoided, but the highest stage in which mm. nations need to open up foreign markets and need to export finance capital in order to maintain their own economies. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, which I mean, it makes sense, right? You know, it's like this, like uh, this mindset of like, yeah, like a. Uh, constantly growing forever growing and stuff you're going to need to keep finding new places to extract resources from uh and everything like that you know like it's um it's easy to see it as a continuation of the same thing or like the logical conclusion you know exactly uh so lenin's writing on this in 1916 uh and then and then uh you get the interwar period between the wars and During this period in the Second World War, or and immediately afterward, uh, the British Empire is in decline. It's dying out. Uh, uh, Territories of the British Empire are breaking away, and they are forming their own independent states, not under formal control by the British state. And this uh, comes to its head at uh, during the Suez Crisis, in which both the Anglo and French empires are. Uh, humiliated utterly and politically and yeah. just break apart mm. most remaining territories leave or there's uh revolutions like in algeria yeah um and public sentiment turns against open control of foreign territory uh this was yeah that was the first Suez crisis there is a second one but it's not particularly particularly relevant um so the role of global imperial hegemon gets handed off essentially from one side of the anglosphere to the other america is now the center of not only like the western block of military powers but also uh the new imperial core Mm -hmm. it is the united states which fuels a lot of this. And then you get yeah. the Cold War, in which mm-hmm. there is competition between the socialist bloc of the Soviet Union and the Western imperialist and capitalist bloc of the US. But you can't just conquer a nation. You're not allowed to just annex foreign territory as a colony. Yeah. That's frowned upon 
that's yeah, yeah. considered bad. So <laughs> yeah. you get institutions, international institutions, after the founding of the United Nations, like the IMF and the World Bank. Yeah. And these institutions, uh, now that you can't just directly control a country's politics, uh, use loans in order to control uh, mm -hmm. internal uh, financial and economic policy. Mm. You, and uh, I think the example I want to point you to the most is uh, Argentina uh, in the 70s. Argentina took out a lot of loans to build up infrastructure and to build wealth. Argentina in the early 20th century was one of the richest nations on earth with an average, with a per capita income higher than that of the United States, but it had fallen behind and it was trying to build back up. Uh, so it took out a lot of loans. And then I'm, I'm checking my notes. Uh, it defaulted. It wasn't able to pay them back. Uh, at all and i'm so sorry i'm just no, you're looking fine. through this no just... it's fine yeah honestly you're doing great by the way yeah, yeah. Don't, don't try i'm just kind it. of cool. astounded at how like young america's dom like superpower status like how how young it is like i i it just you always assume that america's kind of always just been like the top dog and it's in a way but like it really hasn't and i think it's just I think this flies in the face of American exceptionalism, obviously pretty hard, mm -hmm. but it, it does. I, I don't think this is something that America likes to flex or like least likes to discuss that. Like we just yeah. started being like th historically, like we are not, it's been, it's been a second that we've been the superpower, um, had this hegemony and it is pretty violent and pretty widespread, obviously, but like, um, Sometimes in it, it, you think that it's been like this forever. Like it feels like capitalism has always been the system. America has always been oh, yeah. number one or whatever. But no, it's definitely What's that. Not um, the case. There's uh, that Le Guin quote about the um, divine right of kings, um, which is really good. Uh, what is it? It's uh, we live in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable. So did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. It's the same thing, you know, like we feel like, mm -hmm. you know, like Western hegemony, capitalism, you know, like US kind of control has, you know, it seems inescapable, but so did, you know, everyone thought fucking the divine right of kings to be mm -hmm. <laughs> rulers. Like well, yeah. that was just how it was. Always yeah. 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 Anyway, we should, um, we should carry yeah. on with, so yeah, yeah. so following this a lot of the a lot of the real wage in argentina just sort of collapsed a lot of the economy collapsed people tried to implement austerity but uh it just didn't work out and even though uh and the country just didn't receive the foreign investment that it had come to depend on uh so much turmoil occurred that the government faced a military coup in 1976, uh, by the Argentine armed forces. Henry Kissinger, by the way, was the one who arranged this. Of uh, what began was called the National Reorganization Project uh, mm. process, and Argentina fell under a right-wing dictatorship, uh, which sought to rectify this problem. Uh, and that's, that's the case for a lot of Latin American countries. And this is well. and this is how it goes yeah. in South America and in Africa and in Asia yeah. and everywhere else. So much foreign investment, uh, which is used to make these countries dependent on the imperial court, which is who are yeah. the ones who provide these loans and this investment. And it's fucking wild when you look at like Henry Kissinger's personal involvement in so many of these things. It's like. Mm. You know, like the man was like has his fingers in every like evil little pie, like an absolute yeah, he's monster. Easily one of the worst people, absolutely. Thomas Green. Thomas Sankara took power in yes. Burkina Faso mm. at some point. I forget when he came to power. Exactly. Uh, it was the seventies. Um, he he, he yeah. yeah yeah the seventies. He he decided that he was going to be independent. That he was going to focus on yeah. producing and building infrastructure, and that he was going yeah, to be yeah. independent of the Imperial Corps. 
and then he got I bring up a photo of him by the way because i can't stand looking at this gremlin anymore <laughs> <laughs> who were we bringing up a photo? He wanted. He wanted. Uh, he, wanted oh, right, he wanted to make Burkina Faso independent by means of producing its own food, by means of producing its own infrastructure, by means of becoming an economic power in West Africa. And he, when he tried to abandon the uh, West African franc, which is the uh, sort of economic bloc controlled by France, he wanted to give it up. He was cooed for that. And yeah. the government which came after him uh, reintroduced dependence on Western power, on Western loans, and yeah. dismantled everything he did. And this is what happens. Sankara was so based, in fact, that he like actively made men in Africa um, do everything that women did one day a week because he realized how like fucked up patriarchy was. He was like, we're gonna have a week where men look after the children, they go do the shopping, know, they clean the houses. Labor. Yeah, literally, like, he was like, yeah, we're, f we're literally gonna do that. Um, but like he was based in so many ways and it was such a shame, like he literally got murdered by like someone he thought was like a really good friend and comrade. I think the guy's yeah. name was, Dan um, oh no, I can't remember his name, but it begins with a D I think. Uh, or a G, and, and, he, and he basically, he got he got murdered by him, even though a lot of his close-knit people were like, yo, this guy is going to shoot you, like, he's going to yeah. fucking kill you, and he was like, no, we gotta trust people, like, you know, he's he's yeah, been a yeah. friend for years and stuff, and yeah, he just he just fucking murdered That's him, it's real up. sad. Yeah, Mel's and he was out in the chat, like, how he, um, he got everyone completely vaccinated, which over, you know, and yeah. at the time was completely, yeah. like, not a thing happening, he, um, and how he, he actually shifted the culture to become more progressive over time, like, he, he didn't just come in and he was like, all right, everyone were passing a law to respect women you know like yeah no like, he did it so like well yeah, yeah. yeah like over time he gradually shifted the culture um and you know like this is a guy that you know they were like people are gonna kill you or whatever and he would still walk down to the market by himself you know like any he, he wasn't he wasn't like you know sitting in some gated he, he replaced or like that. all of the government vehicles with super yeah. cheap cars like he sold yeah, them yeah, off yeah. yeah and stuff like that uh anyway so in 1991, at the end of 1991, the USSR falls. It's over. The nation's dead. Uh, and suddenly, this Western bloc, which had for years been doing these things to oppose communist influence, suddenly had no more opponents. So they, they'd pull back, right? The world will remain as it is. Nope. IMF, uh, the IMF gives out way more money in loans, uh, mm. way more foreign investment is conducted by the United States and Western Europe. Uh, the rates of foreign intervention increases. The Gulf War had only happened a year before. Uh, the West, now unopposed, grows even more bold in what it attempts to do. And in the heart of the former Soviet Union, it uh, installs Yeltsin uh, in order to deregulate the Russian economy mm -hmm. and to sell off Russian assets. And what happens is that these Russian, these state institutions get sold off for scrap to the lowest bidder, privatized completely. Mm. Yeah, and that's why it's such a joke when, you know, people nowadays are like, oh yeah, Russia, are, they're communists. Like, you know, you get these right-wingers in America who are like, um, oh yeah, we need to fight against we need to fight against Russia because it's communist, but then they also say, well, actually, Russia's pretty base because they don't like gay people, you know, and trans people and stuff. So it's just like that bizarre, like, double fucking take that they've got there. Like, it just it, it completely, like, just wrong on all counts, you know? Um, obviously, they're right about Russia not liking LGBTQIA plus folk, but, uh, you know, definitely yeah. incorrect about communism. Like, they just, they gutted it. They gutted the entire thing. And there were so many people who were like, um, yeah, we remember it being like shit under communism, um, but it's actually way worse now anyway. So, like, you know, it's it's kind of like most most people who were alive in Soviet Russia um, and are still alive now, you know they, they're kind of just like well it seemed like it was a better it was a better thing it's not everyone obviously because lots of people have uh uh you know changed their ideas since since living under capitalism and stuff
But they, it caused all sorts of bizarre things that like caused the rise of the Nazbol movement in Russia, which is like such a bizarre thing. It was that was happening around the time of the fall of the the USSR, and it was such a, an odd mishmash of like uh, Nazis and you know hardened communists and. Yeah, even I mean, anarchists. I think there's always been like that kind of like um yeah like you know like the whole national Bolshevik thing or whatever like has yeah there's always been like a kind of element there, but um it oh hundred percent yeah, wild like. The National Bolshevik Party in Russia was sort of an absurdist party by, uh, yeah. I believe his name is Andrei Limonov. It That's wasn't, his name. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was intended to be purposefully ridiculous, but sort of Limonov's thing was that, like, he thought that what Russia needed was an absolutely absurd party. Yeah. To whatever was popular, whatever conception absolute was popular. Absolute shit poster, right? Like, <laughs> like, that guy would absolutely be on Twitter these days. Yeah. Limanov is a piece of shit, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, yeah, he, yeah, he was a disgusting piece of shit. So we see this emboldening. And sorry this history section is dragging on so long. It's just important. No, it's important. I mean, history's long. <laughs> yeah. So you <laughs> see the first steps of this in Iraq. And Iraq had already gone through the Gulf War. It had been devastated already. And the U.S., uh, says we're going to sanction you and these sanctions are murderous brutal uh with no more block to oppose them they have a universally applied sanctions regime uh in iraq and this sanction regime kills five hundred thousand children and hundreds of thousands of adults. Mm. And oh, after shit. this devastation, uh, 9-11 happens. And the U.S. says, well, we're just going to invade. Yeah. And kills a million more. And this invasion, A, quieted an anti-U.S. voice in the world. And B, opened up a foreign market. And not necessarily because the Iraqi people wanted iPhones and televisions and stuff. But sort of conflict takes on a new form at this point, which is uh, bad if you're an Iraqi civilian or an American or anyone else. But it's really yeah. good if you're a Lockheed Martin or a Raytheon executive or a shareholder. You get these drawn out occupations that take decades and waste so much money and resources. And... Uh, but it's really, really good for driving up the profits of these defense companies, of this military-industrial complex. So they do it. Hmm. Yeah, like, obviously, like, that's the, the, the main fucking reason that they went in there and did that in it. Um, and I feel like um, there's something, someone... <sighs> it was Hillary Clinton recently, wasn't it, talking about, like, fucking Afghanistan and uh russia like she was she was like talking about how like oh you know uh, russia tried to fucking invade afghanistan and stuff which is like also not entirely true the, the soviet union went into afghanistan to support uh a, a like communist socialist party that were basically democratically elected there um and the the people who were fighting against them the mujahideen were like funded by the US and the, and the fucking and the UK. Yeah, you to, know. To, to, to... yes. Literally to destabilize it. And it was so absurd that she literally brought that up to to sort of like, you know, compare what was happening in Ukraine. It's like, oh Russia does this all the time and like goes in and it's like, what are you talking about? It's two completely different uh, scenarios that you're on about. It's so absurd. Uh, uh, but yeah, sorry, not, not only that, but starting with the Gulf War, the U.S. implemented a no-fly zone over the nation of Iraq. And this no-fly zone would last until the beginning of the Iraq War. Uh, the reason why the Iraq War was over so quickly was because Iraq was literally not allowed to have an air force. The U.S. blew up every sorry. Iraqi fighter plane that took off. Mm. And, you know... Think about how people are calling for a no-fly zone to be established over Ukraine. Exactly. Yeah. Right, right. I think people don't understand what that means. I think they, they think that no-fly zone means like, oh, we're just going to, you know, make it so they can't fly planes in and out of the area or something. It's like, no, it means that 
they will shoot down anything they see. Literally anything. You know, like yeah. literally, like that's that's that's. It, it means it means like, anything in the air over yeah. that area yeah. is shot down. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Doesn't matter what it is. Mm. At, at the point at which that no fly zone was issued, by the way, there were only three no fly zones in, in the world: one over Bosnia, one over Libya, and one over Iraq. Mm. Right, of course, like yeah, like uh, yeah, like the, and that, that's that's another like conflict area as well, like like completely pertinent to what you were saying earlier about like the EU or like maybe countries being in Europe doesn't necessarily mean they're in in the the imperial core. Like Bosnia was somewhere that was like absolutely fucked over, uh, and that's it's it's basically Europe, like the Balkans. You know, look look, look at the state of Libya right now. Right, right. Right. Uh, yeah. Do people really want that for Ukraine? Yeah, 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 absolutely. This is it. This is it. Fucking slave markets. Fucking. Yeah, yeah, legitimate. And like, this is what happens, right? You know, like, um, yeah, and it, it's wild. Like, this is we've seen this happen. We've seen this play out so many times, you know. Yeah. And it's wild because, uh, like, it seems like in a lot of uh, media that I have been exposed to there hasn't been too much like and i mean like you know more mainstream media there hasn't been too much kind of um pushback against the kind of like you know the us and the nato kind of line of like you know this is the you know like uh that we need to push back we need to you know do sanctions we need to you know like establish a no fly zone or whatever like that it seems like what i remember from growing up with you know like iraq and stuff like that there was like always um like, the, you know, there was, like, people speaking out. There was, like, musicians. It was, like, I remember, like, in the newspaper over here and stuff, there would be, you know, people talking about it being, like, hey, is this what we should be doing? Is it whatever? But um, it's wild. I mean, maybe it just is, like, a kind of, you know, speaks to how, um, I guess, like, the media has become more, um, I guess, I mean, I'd say, like, um, more entrenched in, um, or I guess, like, the uh, like less uh there's like less um i would say less alternative voices in um in media you say well actually not even that like i would say like you know like there's a lot of um you know like a lot of big publishing um outfits did speak against the war back in the day or whatever like that even in like kind of corny liberal ways or whatever like that but um it just seems like everyone is kind of a little bit more like under the thumb these days i'm not sure what's up with that but um if, if you yeah. If you want to hear about the one over Bosnia, I would suggest looking up Operation Deny Flight. Oh, yeah. Operation Deny Flight. Yeah. Very cool. I'm going to write that down. Um, yeah, because that's the thing. Like, a lot of people, they don't understand what this, what it means to say, like, no fly zone. So I see, like, a lot of, you know, like, the liberal kind of infographic types are saying, like, you know, like, why we should have a no fly zone. It's like, you don't realize what you're, what you're talking about here, you know? Like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah anyway. I've been seeing that a but lot. Yeah, no, People mm. talk about no-fly zones, and it's especially being peddled by very not smart people on the internet. And like, I keep seeing them <laughs> yeah. come out in droves, like yeah. talking, like, flexing this so-called expertise on no-fly zones. And I'm like, what is a no-fly yeah, yeah. zone, and why is it only dumbasses talking about it right now? That's the only vibe. That's the only information I have on no-fly zones. And, I've talked about it. it. We never got into it really, but that's it. That's it's it. the same with like sanctions and stuff as well. You know, people saying like sanctions are a way towards peace. Like sanctions, like uh, Putin doesn't give a fuck about sanctions. No, no, you know? no, no sanctions regime has ever worked. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll just tell you that right now. No yeah, 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 sanctions yeah, regime has ever accomplished its stated goal. They have accomplished their goals, which is to immiserate the populace of whatever country yeah, they're yeah, yeah. The working yeah. class population are the ones. Like, you see, like, already, you know, like, PayPal and all these other uh, payment, you know, like, uh, verification, transaction services, whatever, have, um, you know, started rejecting, uh, you know, Russian transactions and things like that. So you get all these people, like you know gig workers um artists even like streamers uh, a lot of twitch streamers in in russia are now like completely out of work you know anyone that already had like a precarious income or whatever like you know like now it's even more compromised or whatever you know like, I, these I, people I, are saying like they're just the, completely fucked the stated goal is is to like you know uh get ordinary russians to rise up against the government but like yeah. i have a queer friend in russia 
and she's like, you know, like 19. And I send her money occasionally because she fucking yep. needs it. And I sent her like 300 bucks because I knew like Switch was going to be taken down. And now I can't send her shit. I can't help her. Yep. What's she going to do against yeah, yeah, fucking yeah. the Russian government? Well, here's the like, yeah. like These people, like they have no money or time to do that anymore. You know? <laughs> like, I had an absurd interaction on Twitter today with someone who was saying that like sanctions against Russian Twitch streamers was oh, a good thing did you see that because it, they were saying like oh Something yeah every si every single russian person's taxes go goes to towards their their wars and i was like how do you feel about like the uk and us citizens yeah, yeah. whose taxes go towards their wars and of course that fucking you know that idiot just didn't even yeah. respond to that because they're just they just uh, uh, you know basically repeat what they fucking heard they repeat what they've heard people in the ruling class say which is like mm. russians need to be punished do you know what i mean because of course people in the ruling class don't give a fuck about people in russia who would oppose uh you know what's going on there and stuff it's uh, yeah. absurd i want to i want to repeat something that um uh crowd babe said because i think it's really important i know we we we're we're absolutely saying it but i want to say it straight up that there's no such thing as targeted sanctions that yeah. that that uh, that hurt only the leaders sanctions because i've seen liberals i even tweet about this this morning i think we was re we were reading this article the other day on stream and i had a tweet about this morning because i couldn't stop thinking about it. this this liberal who is like he's like one of the main contributors to lgbtq nation i'm not really sure what's going on there but like he wrote mm. this thing about how like we should be like issuing targeted sanctions at putin and the russian oligarchs oh, and like you cannot do that that's not yeah, how that no. works. You, what will happen how is your sanctions is another thing, right? It's, it's, it's an absurd. Like literally, how does that even work? That was yeah. that would mean. It's, that... It's, it's, it's... Yeah, go ahead. We're go we're gonna sanction the oligarchs. What you're gonna sanction Lower Manhattan? Like... <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, right? Yeah, yeah right. Right, exactly. Um, well, like there's like all the you know like the um like how they have all the mansions and like you know just outside of London and everything like that. It's like you know it's like shit like how are you gonna sanction you know these people like with that live and operate within a completely different world to the working class of the people that are fucking you know the of the country that is fucking you know being uh being sanctioned that's ridiculous yeah it's absurd there's no such thing and sanctions don't work even in south africa they didn't work the reason south africa mm -hmm. collapsed was because they got defeated in the angolan civil war their military was absolutely destroyed, routed, and suddenly they had to listen to the overwhelming majority black populace. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah. I also want to uh, touch yeah. on real Sorry, quick, on. what do sanctions do if they don't, um, which, by the way, Lena, you were describing your relationship with your, like, your friend not being able to get money, but let's just say it straight up. What, what do sanctions do if they don't target Putin or whoever else we're trying to target? What are the results? What what happens? Say if the United States does want to sanction, does sanction Russia? Which are we already? Did the United States already sanction Russia? I'm. I yeah, 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 There's yeah. There's mul yeah. multiple. Okay. I think 113 articles so, or something like that. Yeah. And so, what is the result of that going to be? What does that actually look like in actuality? I know the answer, but it I'm waiting looks, for someone else to say it. <laughs> it's the vast immiseration of the populace. Yeah, right. yeah. It hurts the proletariat. It just, it just kills. I mean, it it kills them. Um. So, I know you were yeah, talking literally. before about sanctions killing children. Um. I think you were talking about Iran. Was it with the, with the sanctions that were killing people? Um. If you're Iraq, it was Iraq. Excuse Iraq. Me, Iraq. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but um, sanctions on Iran do kill people. Like, yeah, yeah, there are sanctions on Iran as well, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that that is what. Well, like, I know it's a little bit off topic from like talking about history, but I just want to say that that is what that is the result of this. Sanctioning a country hurts the most vulnerable members of that country, and that and it's a really sick, sick tactic that liberals seem to like be content with, which is this: no, we're just going to hurt common people the most marginalized most vulnerable common people yeah. common, like the workers so hard that they'll end up being so desperate that they'll have to revolt against their leaders it's a, that that's mm -hmm. like their actually if you actually explain to them that the sanctions hurt working class people that's their 
if, if they manage to get that far in the conversation without ducking out, they're going to end up giving that rationale. I want to say that that is all disgusting. It'll be like next election. They'll be so upset by the sanctions and next election that comes around, they'll just, they'll vote them out. That's oh my God, they'll, they'll, they'll so vote hard. Out. So they're hard. They're going to vote yeah. so hard and they're going to, yeah. I think, uh, I, I mean, the Afghan government do a bunch of foreign assets got frozen and now they're not allowed to import food. So now there's a famine in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. And it's like literally, literally just pulled out, let the government they set up fall, and then yeah. is now starving the country. Mm, yeah, it's ridiculous. And it's like, yeah, obviously, like the people in charge don't. They're no, like they're not going to have trouble getting food. You know, it's 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 not them that uh that suffer mm. from this. They, yeah, yeah. They, they, they gave half of that money to nine eleven victims, which is the most absurd. It's, it's, it's a yeah. literal expropriation of wealth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was and that? A, a um... Disgusting one as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway, sorry. We should carry on. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was gonna get distracted again. So, so, so now we have this sort of global, unaccountable hegemon who has been like sort of leading the world for the last 30 years. Yeah. And this is uh, what Fukuyama described as the end of history. It's just eternal mm. US hegemony. Hasn't he, um, hasn't he uh, apologized that for that since? And he's been yeah. like, oh, actually, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe history didn't end. <laughs> it just Yeah, but <laughs> you know, you know, he's, he's, he's yeah. never, I mean, what he's describing there is the end of historical materialism. Mm. That, that socialism will never <laughs> arrive. But also, it's really funny to keep knocking on him for that, you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's always good. <laughs> and this is, and this is like, uh, increased tenfold by globalization, by the, like, forcing of countries to have free trade policies. NAFTA is a net expropriation of labor from Mexico to the U.S. and Canada. Mm -hmm. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was going to do the same thing. Yes, yes, that was a huge one for us. Oh, man, yeah. yeah, I remember that going mm. down. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Trans-Pacific um, uh, Partnership the was... EPP. Yeah, wasn't that like something under Obama? Yeah, yeah, it was around then. Yeah. Um, and there was, yeah. like, there was huge mobilization against it um, uh, down here. Uh, but it was also like that thing where it's like a lot of the same with like the Occupy thing where it was like there was a good chunk of normal working class people that were against it and then there was like this fringe of just like weird conspiratorial kind of people and some of those yeah. people that kind of established some level of clout have gone on to like you know they were like kind of part of the whole like convoy thing down here and all that kind of stuff and it's like that danger of um, people kind of like approaching these things but not having um not having the the tools to actually kind of look at it you know in the correct way or whatever you know to understand yeah. the bigger forces at work they don't understand the situations so they fall into the kind of reactionary traps and all that kind of stuff but yeah so the reason why so now now we're in this situation the u.s is global hegemon Yep. It is the sole imperial power. Let's let's be real. It is the yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it is forcibly opening markets all over the world. It conducted a coup in Bolivia in 2019. Yeah. To open its lithium reserves. Mm -hmm. It is just the sole power. So Yeah. What is the future? Is the question. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it kind of seems like that's that's where it's going to go because the lithium mines, I might be wrong in this, but I think they're specifically connected to Tesla and they're connected to like batteries that like Elon Musk and Tesla need to develop like military applications for the US military and I, stuff. I, I more mean what's the future of the global hegemonic system? Oh, right. Yeah, oh, sure. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah, so... So... <laughs> I want to read a paragraph real fast um, before oh, yeah. we get too far off the Russia topic. Um, Pat Patata says, due to the sanctions, a lot of people in Russia cannot get help from the outside. They need the money if they want to protest against the war to be able to pay the bail if they get arrested. They are now unable to send money to their Ukrainian friends. And... Uh, uh, Ukrainian never had PayPal, but Russia has. Okay. And lastly, there are LGBTQIA plus Russian citizens who need money to flee the country. Sanctions target the most vulnerable, and not only in Russia, but also in Ukraine. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good, yeah. that's a good summation and a, like a specific description description of like, when we talk about targeting the most vulnerable people, sometimes like, uh, you know, it's sometimes it's helpful to go into a specific example of how that actually works. And I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. 100%. So, 100%. Yeah, so for the last 30 years, we've lived in a unipolar world. There is one global power that exerts its influence uh, over everyone else. Uh, before then, we had a multipolar world in which there were two powers, one imperial, one not. So, now, and we can all recognize that America is in decline. America influence is waning, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, everyone here should agree in the well, chat. Well, that's, that's, why, uh, that's why Putin's throwing his weight around, right? Because Putin? he yeah like they've not it, i heard i now i might be wrong on this because you know i don't want to be i don't want to be one of those guys who has a take on what's going on and gets it completely wrong but this is something i i heard someone say is that it's like russia feels more confident now to do stuff like what they're doing in ukraine because the sort of like the 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 stuff that america's trying to do with nato in europe is like fucking up so bad basically am i wrong in saying oh, that? it's it's also because uh, yeah, after the fall of Kabul, people realized that NATO's absolute yeah. dominance no longer existed. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, also, yeah. NATO was threatening expansion into Ukraine. And that was a red line in Russian geopolitics. They couldn't allow that if they wanted to maintain any sort of regional influence. Yeah. Right. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.